Good morning. Good morning. Let's open our service this morning and stand and sing. God can do anything but fail. Stand as we sing. <laughs> God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save, he can keep, he can cleanse, and he will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. Amen. You may be seated. God can do anything but fail. It's Amen. good to have you here this morning at Beulah Baptist Church. Hope that you're blessed as a result of being here on this nice spring morning. It's like as some people were saying it was 61 at their houses. I think the sign out there says about 56 or 57. So it's nice weather. Stick around uh, and it'll change. Uh, and it's supposed to all change by tomorrow from what I hear. So, but, and we had a, a big bout of rain, just poured down the rain right before the early service this morning. So just all kinds of weather here in West Virginia. We just aim to please everybody. Uh, and so just hang around if you don't like it. So, but it's good that you're here this morning. Uh, here in these four walls, there's no better place to be on a Sunday morning than in God's house with God's people. We hope that you're blessed as a result of the service. If you're a newcomer here, we have little blue cards in the pew racks. Please take that, put your name on it and the other information that's requested, and then place that in the offering plate when it comes by, and that will allow us to express to you how glad we were uh, to have you here uh, this morning. So, But we hope that through all aspects of the service that you were blessed and that you were strengthened uh, in your faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Father, we thank you for all of our friends and our family that are gathered here. Father, we thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy, for the comfort that it gives us, for the way that it encourages us in our faith. But Father, most of all, we thank you for our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask that our focus this morning would be upon him. As we fellowship, as we sing, as we hear from your word, may all of it just lift him high and, and cause our attention to be drawn upon him. Father, we love you, we praise you. May you just be edified and glorified in this service today. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we ask it. Amen. Let's continue on with our service and stand and sing, The Longer I Serve Him. Stand as we sing. seated. This time Jay's going to come and share our announcements. Morning. Morning. All right. Let's see. Tonight, six o'clock, we're hunting and gathering again. The women will be uh, gathering, I assume, in the back room, there, right? 6 p.m. in the uh, ministry center and the men out front, right? Yeah, somewhere. We'll work it out. We'll flip a coin there when we get there at 6 and see who's going to be where. So AB men and AB women tonight, 6 o'clock. And then, uh, and then uh, this afternoon is the spaghetti dinner fundraiser over at First Baptist. That's for their, their Haiti fundraiser. So uh, please, if you're uh, wanting, looking to, for lunch, there it is. So right after service there, noon to 2. And then this Wednesday, we're going to have a special business meeting. Uh, right at 7 o'clock, there's two items on there if you want to look at and check those out. And uh, we'll be all ready for that. And then Awana this Wednesday. Okay, it says it's store night. No, not store night. It's game night. And also, it's uh, they're to wear their favorite superhero shirts. 
So kids, get your favorite superhero shirts all ready. We've got a plan in our house. I think we're going to just wear pajamas <laughs> since that's got some of the superheroes. Maybe. Kill two birds, one stone, right? There you go. All right. So then uh, also we got coming up here, oh, uh, next up, uh, nursery volunteers. If, uh, you know, if you'd like to help out down there in the nursery, you can get some sign-ups going with that. Sign up on the door. So, okay, that's where the sign-up sheets are with that. So please, if you can help out, they'll be, uh, at, as you're dropping off kids today, probably, uh, hey, you got some time? So we'll be checking that out. All right, and your insert there, we got the March activities coming up. March Madness is upon us. So here we go. Get all the, check all those out. We've got all the uh, different specials coming up there. So looking forward to that. And then the Camp Cowan dates. Um, so you can uh, check those out. Pastor was talking a little bit about that. So we'll, we'll get that going. Had a couple of pictures to, to show you. If, you were, uh, if you've been in, under a rock here, you might have missed this one. Wait, no, not that one. Come on now. There we go. Yes, our own Megan Kisner, Athlete of the Week. So, so good job, Megan. Big, huge congratulations to you there. Yeah, it was in the paper. Grafton got it on their sign. I, I, we got to talk to the sign guy here. What the heck is wrong with him? It doesn't have it on our sign yet. We'll have to take care of that. But, uh, yes, good job, Megan. And let's see. Oh, yeah. And then uh, Jada, uh, uh, it's her birthday this week. You'll see that on the birthday list. But so went out there and found, uh, I guess they're doing some work at this one uh, orphanage uh, there this month. And uh, so I think that's what some of the stuff here, here is going on there. But uh, definitely keep her in your prayers. And she's got a new post out there with some of the updates of what's going on. So be sure to go out there and check that out. And then uh, later this week when it's her birthday, be sure to go on her page and wish her a happy birthday. So I know she'll appreciate that. And uh, you know, definitely just keep her in your prayers as, as, they're, as she's going on, on with her mission trip here. All right, birthdays. We've got Josie Charlton, Busty Weber, Jada Charlton, Bryn Rogers, Alexander Knotts, Louise Ripple, Laura Lafferty, and Diana Swisher. So happy birthday, everybody, on there. And our scripture reading comes out of 1 Timothy, and Jim's going to come and read that to us. What I get? Did you look up the wrong one? What's wrong, Jim? You're looking at it funny. Did you go to 2 Timothy? It's okay. Uh, Jim always likes a big intro, so that today is what he's doing. I actually had something to think about. That's all right. All right. Genesis, Exodus. Timothy, Timothy. It's, it's New Testament. First James, second James. <laughs> Don't want a kids could help you. <laughs> All right, four, six, and ten. Okay, here we go. All right. First Timothy chapter four, verses six through ten. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nursed up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Like Jim, and if our ushers will come, we'll take up our morning offering.
Jason Griffith, will you pray for the offering, please? This time we have a special from the choir. Thank you, choir. Let's take our hymnals now and turn to 465, Springs of Living Water, 465, and we'll go ahead and let the kids go downstairs for Junior Church. 465, stand as we sing. As Joy plays the next verse, we'll let the choir go down and you get around and greet each other this morning. <laughs> Thank you. 
And the last verse. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is falling deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking from the springs of living be seated. Before we uh, get into our prayer concerns, we have a movie coming up on Friday, March 8th. The name of the movie is The American Gospel, and it's a family movie. And basically, it, and I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis here, and then we're going to show you a trailer of it. Um, but it compares a lot of the false gospels that are being preached today in our society and in our country with the true biblical gospel. And it's a very uh, uh, enlightening type of thing, very well done, uh, very inspirational. So we plan to have something for the children. This is not really a children's thing, uh, but it's definitely for the adults. And you'll want to come to this and learn through this and enjoy this. So, But we're going to show about a two-minute clip of this so you can just kind of get a feel for that. And hopefully this will whet your appetite for Friday, March the 8th, so you can come out as part of this uh, family night movie event and, and see this movie that we have for you. Jay? It is a pain to know that there are people who do not know Jesus. It is a greater pain to know that oftentimes Jesus and Christianity is being distorted. All my life I've heard people talk about believing in God, but God believes in us, in you. There will never be another you. You are an original. The Bible's not about you. We're assuming that people understand the gospel. See, the cross to me isn't the revelation of my sin. The cross is actually the revealing of my value. People say the cross is a sign of how much man is worth. That's not true. The cross is a sign of how depraved we really are, that it took the death of God's own son. We're not saved from loneliness. We're not saved from being insecure. We are saved from God himself. That's not the God I worship. That's not the God of the Bible. How could that ever be good news? Scripture says that we make the mistake of thinking God was like us. And what you do is you create a God who only wants to give you all the desires of your heart. Money! Come on, to me! You know, God wants you healthy. I worked for my uncle Benny Hinn, who's a famous faith healer. The origins of the prosperity gospel are not Christian at all. It's a completely different religion. We stayed in hotels upwards of $20,000 a night. What I need is not more paint on a dead corpse. What I need is a resurrection. How does that work exactly? Like by what cosmic mechanism does the death of Jesus take care of your personal sins? There was a time in my life that I thought the goal of preaching was to get people to do what they don't want to do. That's not Christianity. Christianity is having a heart that is changed so that you begin to hate the sin you once loved and love the righteousness you once hated. I'm not any better physically, but I am so much happier because I have Jesus and he's right here. The social ill and problem of our generation has been the problem of every generation preceding us. It's the problem of man's nature. You may have some things wrong with you, but can I tell you, you have a lot more right with you. Most preaching today bypasses a man's sin. We've got men and pulpits that should have been motivational speakers. I think that's why we see so many unbelievers in the church who believe they're believers. I am blessed. He became a curse. Today, I hold no positions that are in agreement with my family, the Word of Faith theology, or the prosperity gospel. And the reason for that is I've come to an understanding of the true gospel. If there's some part of the Bible that you don't understand how it connects to the gospel, that's a part of the Bible you're not ready to preach yet. Okay, so that's just a little sample of what you'll get on Friday night, and we encourage you to come and be a part of that. Okay, for our prayer time this morning, 
Uh, we have a lot of things that are in the bulletin. We have requests there, as we always do. Folks that are ill, uh, folks that are in the military, uh, some new requests. Uh, also for our children's ministries, for Awana, uh, for the Anna Jarvis Good News Club, so continue to pray for those, for our caregivers. But then we have a few special things that I'd like for us to, to uh, have as our focus uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, we want to pray for Baptist Campus Ministries. Uh, that's one of the extensions of ministry of the West Virginia Baptist Convention, of which we are a part as Beulah Baptist. Uh, and they have ministries on just about every college campus in the state. And this is a wonderful ministry for kids that are going off to college and going through all those turbulent years. And, and rather than them getting caught up in a lot of the wrong crowd, this provides them with the right crowd, uh, with godly students, uh, godly instruction, uh, godly fellowship. Uh, and so, uh, but just pray for Baptist Campus Ministries. We had several young men yesterday at our breakfast sharing, uh, and it was just good to hear what they had to say. So, but pray for that, that that'll be more and more effective uh, in reaching uh, college-age people and strengthening them uh, in their faith. We also want to pray for Camp Cowan. Um, that's uh, in your bulletin, the schedule of the camps. Uh, they're beginning to put together directors now and volunteers and that sort of thing. This is another ministry of the West Virginia Baptist Convention, uh, and it's the most successful evangelistic ministry of the state convention. We have hundreds of kids every year that accept Christ as Savior. Uh, we have several young people that are called into full-time vocational ministry as a result of Camp Cowan. And yes, we have some camp romances that, that spring up and eventually these folks, they get married and, and now some of them are in ministry, some are missionaries, uh, and, uh, but God is doing all kinds of good things at Camp Cowan every single summer. Uh, and so if you've got information, look over that. We can get you a form uh, to fill out and to send in if you'd like to send your young person or your child to Camp Cowan. Uh, it, it is a life-changing experience. So, but pray for that, uh, that God will continue to work through that whole process. And then pray for the lost. Uh, we have a lot of folks that need to know Christ. You have folks in your family and your neighborhood, and we have folks in this community. So pray that God would use you uh, to reach them and, and to be gospel message to them. And, and also to speak the gospel to them. So we're going to have a few moments of private meditation. If you'd like to slip forward and kneel down at, at the altar here, feel free to do that. Uh, and then after we have a few moments of private meditation, we'll be led together in our prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for many things. We thank you for our families. Thank you for our homes. We thank you for the health that we possess. It may not be perfect health. We may have our aches and pains and, and our challenges, but we're able to get here this morning. And Father, we thank you so much for, for that privilege and opportunity. But Father, most of all, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the great love that that he has bestowed upon us. And the scripture says in Romans 5, 8, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the demonstration of his love. That's the extent of his compassion and his mercy and his grace. Father, this morning we are undeserving. We are unworthy. But Father, we thank you that you've chosen to save us. For those of us who are in the family of God, who have been born again, 
Father, we thank you for the joy and the peace and, and, and the promise of heaven that is ours. Not because of anything we've done, but because of the grace and mercy of your Son. As he offered up his life on the cross of Calvary and has shed his blood there, and died in our place and to, to take away your wrath and so that we could be clothed in the righteousness of Christ and stand before you with confidence and approach your throne in prayer and confidence knowing that you will hear us because we are now your children and we've been transformed by your son. And Father, for anyone here this morning who doesn't know Jesus, convict their hearts and their minds of the joy and, and, and the life that they're missing. Draw them out of the darkness and bring them into the light. Father, we pray for the special request that we have this morning for Baptist Campus Ministry, that you would just guide and work through all of those college campuses. Father, college can be a very traumatic time. It can be a time when young people get caught with the wrong crowd and go in the wrong direction and depart from the faith. Or it can also be a time where their faith is strengthened and it's reinforced by godly men and women and relationships that are built. So, Father, we pray for this ministry that would continue to be effective and that it would touch all of our young people and just anchor them in their faith and lead those who are lost to Christ. We pray, Father, for Camp Cowan as well. We thank you for that place. We thank you for that ministry, for the souls that are saved, for the lives that are called into full-time vocational ministry, for couples that get together and, and make an impact for the remainder of their lives and for eternity. Father, we pray that we would send our kids there as well and that we would see the great blessing that that can be to them, to get away from all the distractions and, and all the technology and all the other things and spend time with others and, and spend time in your word and in prayer and in rejoicing together. Father, just use that place and all the people who are associated with it for the, the advancement of your kingdom. We pray, Father, for the lost. We have so many around us that need to know Christ. We, we live in a day and age that seems to be increasingly dark and depraved. But Father, we are entrusted with the message of reconciliation. You have brought us together with, with, with you as, as a result of what your son has done. You've reconciled us to yourself through Jesus. And now may we be agents of reconciliation to others and speak the message of the gospel to them and share with them what you've laid on our hearts. Father, we pray for those who are ill, that you would grant healing to their bodies. But for those who don't, do not receive healing, we pray that you'd give them comfort and strength. Remind them of your presence with them and your promises to them. And most of all, remind them of the promise of eternal life that is ours in Christ Jesus. Forgive us, Father, for our sins and how we fall short of what you'd have us to do. May we confess our sins, realizing that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we open up your word now, may it speak to our hearts and minds. May it enlighten our, 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 our thinking and may it compel our wills to go forth and to do the work that you would have us to do and live the lives that you would have us to lead. Father, we thank you for so many things. But most of all, we praise and thank you for Jesus on this day. For it's in his precious and holy name that we ask all these things this morning. Amen. Turn in your Bibles um, to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, if you're not already there. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. It is no secret that I make a regular practice of running. I do it for fitness. I train for longer distance races. I'm not fast by any means, uh, but it's just something I do. It's, it's a hobby and it's a sport. Now, as, as that word has gotten out, people love to throw Proverbs 28.1 to me, and they love to quote that, and there's kind of a smile or a smirk that comes on their faces as they do. And you may be thinking, preacher, what's, uh, what does Proverbs 28.1 say? Well, let me share it with you. It says, evil people run even though no one is chasing them. 
and they just like to throw that at me and label me with that and that sort of thing, and that's very funny. And, and so, uh, but the key to any kind of athletic endeavor, whether it's running, whether it's basketball, football, soccer, or something else, is training. There has to be training involved. Uh, Megan Kisner, by the way, as we've already heard, um, um, Kisner was named the Taylor County Student Athlete of the Week this past week. Megan, congratulations again on that. She is a beast when it comes to basketball. Now, I say that for those of you who don't understand the terminology, that's a complimentary or a complimentary uh, term. That's not a negative thing. She does well with soccer, too. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, we have several strong, exceptional young athletes as a part of Buell. Is this mic going in and out, Jay? We haven't, okay, I just, I feel like that I'm echoing and then I'm not echoing, so I just need to stay close to this for a while until you get it worked out. Something on this one. Do I need to turn it off? It's on my ear thing, okay. All right, anyway, uh, most of these outstanding athletes that we have here at Buell, young athletes, are ladies. But regardless, that kind of performance doesn't just happen. There is training over and over and over again. What happens on the court, what happens on the field, or on the track is usually a reflection of all the training that took place behind the scenes. So what does the Bible have to say about training? Actually, the Bible has a lot to say about training. It says in our passage for this morning that athletic training is of some value. But it does command training for godliness. Verse 7 of this morning's passage says, train yourselves for godliness. Now, training is a progression of those, those you may not know. Training is usually a, a regimen that progresses from lighter physical efforts to greater physical efforts. Strength and endurance are the results of training. Now, there are a lot of people today who grasp what it means to train physically, but there are far less people who grasp what it means to train spiritually. Spiritual training or, or training for godliness is commanded by our Lord. So how exactly do you and I train to be godly? What does that look like? Well, there are three insights from this morning's passage that give us an idea of what it means to train for godliness. First of all, to train for godliness, commit to biblical doctrine. Commit to biblical doctrine. Verses 6 and 7 say, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, Silly myths, rather train yourselves for godliness. So in his letter to Timothy up to this point, Paul has been instructing him on Christian beliefs. Paul is Timothy's mentor, and so that's his place to instruct him and to give him guidance and to tell him things that he needs to be doing. He says to be trained in the words of faith, which is the Bible, and of good doctrine. Now what exactly is doctrine. And some folks may think, well, that's what you get when you go to the medical office. You go to MedExpress or whatever, you get some doctrine. But that's, that's not, in, in the biblical sense, that's not what it means. So doctrine, for many people, it's an intimidating term. When you really get down to it, it's something that's reserved for theologians. It's reserved for pastors and serious Bible teachers. But just for the person in the pew and the average ordinary Christian, it's not for them. But biblically, sound doctrine is something that every believer should possess. Webster's Dictionary defines doctrine as something that is taught. Doctrine is a set of beliefs that is passed on to others. In this movie clip, you heard bad doctrine and false doctrine, and you also heard biblical doctrine, teaching that's passed on to others. So, so even if you aren't a teacher, even if you're not a preacher, even if you're not a leader in the church, you still have a set of beliefs about God and about life that shape the way you think and shape the way you communicate with others. One doctrine that's often shared, and I'm just giving you one example, 
God helps those who help themselves. Preacher, I disbelieve that. I've heard that for years. God helps those who help themselves. That's what the good book says. Well, that is not what the good book says. That's nowhere to be found in the Bible. Benjamin Franklin said that. So that's bad doctrine. That's a popular saying, but it's bad doctrine. Now, there's a lot of bad doctrine or false teaching that's circulating nowadays, and false teaching comes not just from your television. It can also come from your neighbor down the street. Bad doctrine can come from, from the words that you receive from a person that shows up on the holidays who's convinced that he knows all there is to know about every subject under the sun, including theology and the Bible, and so he just spouts one thing off and then another. But the Bible commands you to have good doctrine or sound doctrine, and that's doctrine that's based on the entirety of Scripture. One Christian writer defines good doctrine in this way. He says, teaching from God, about God, that directs us to the glory of God. Sound doctrine is based squarely upon the entirety of God's word. Now, the reason I say entirety is because it's very common nowadays to find folks who will cherry pick scripture. And you'll take one verse and you'll pull that verse out of context, and you try to build a whole worldview around that, and the rest of the Bible says something differently. So we need to make sure we're based upon the entirety of Scripture and not just upon one or two verses that we would like to cherry-pick and build everything around those. Possessing sound doctrine in your life doesn't happen overnight. You commit to it. You train for it. You read. You pray. You study, you attend church, you attend Bible studies, and you do that faithfully. You follow a regimen to get there. That's the way to commit to biblical doctrine. Now, for a lot of folks today, and maybe you're sitting there this morning, and you're hearing these words, and you're thinking, this, this, this is kind of foreign to me. This, this is strange, and, and this is unpleasant. This sounds like something that, that uh, it would be maybe rather difficult. You mean that after I'm born again that God actually expects me to do something? And the answer is yes. Well, I thought the, the Christian life was all about what God does for me. Well, salvation and regeneration are about what Jesus does for you. You can't save yourself. Christ has to save you. You look to him. He saves you from your sin. But then as you grow and as you're set apart for God and as you mature in your faith, all of that is about denying yourself and sacrificing so that you can become more the person God would have you to be. Now, hope, but God's Holy Spirit is working in all of that, but you have to put the sweat equity into it as well. That's what Scripture tells us. Luke 9, verses 23 through 24 says, and Jesus is speaking, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So the Holy Spirit definitely helps you and empowers you, but you have to make an investment as well. You have to put forth the effort and put forth the consistent effort as well. Hebrews 12, 11 is another verse. It says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So when it comes to the need to embrace and pursue sound biblical doctrine, most believers in the church today are just oblivious to that. Doctrine is boring, and, 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 and learning about theology is, is dull. I want something that will make me feel good and make me feel good right now. But by its very nature, when you get back to training, and for those of you who know about athletic training, training doesn't make you feel good right away. Now, you may feel good a little later, but right at the time, usually it, it, it's kind of rough. Uh, it's, it's hard. Uh, years ago, a traveling salesman was going from one house to another, knocking on doors. For those of you who are a lot younger, there was a day and age when salesmen, rather than you ordering something online, they'd come to your door and they'd go through the neighborhood and they'd knock, go from door to door. And so this traveling salesman was knocking from, from door to door, and he walked up on one porch. And through the door there, and the glass in the door, he could see a small boy sitting at a piano, and he heard scales being played up and down. Now, if you've had any kind of musical training, you know what I'm talking about. 
you know that the playing scales are not fun. Up and down, up and down. And so then he knocked on the door. And the boy slid off the bench and greeted him. The salesman said, young man, is your mother at home? The boy looked at him with kind of a shocked, puzzled frown on his face, and he said, of course she is. If she wasn't, do you think I'd be playing these scales? <laughs> he was not having a good time. But those scales were musical training. And he was growing, and he was maturing, and he was honing his ability. So to train for godliness, commit to biblical doctrine. Commit to it. Say, this is what I am going to do for the glory of God and to grow in faith. Learn it. Study it. Take advantage of all the opportunities you have. And in this day and age of technology, there are all kinds of opportunities to study God's Word. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be smart, so to speak. You just need to be a born-again believer who is willing to learn. It applies to all of us here this morning who are saved, who have been born again. One of my favorite theologians is R.C. Sproul. Listen to what he says on this issue. I like him because he's just, he's a very intelligent man, but he's just blunt at times. He says, here then is the real problem of our negligence. We fail in our duty to study God's word, not so much because it's difficult to understand, not so much because it's dull and boring, but because it is work. Our problem is not a lack of intelligence or a lack of passion. Our problem is that we are lazy. So in this day and age, Followers of Christ cannot afford to be lazy when it comes to biblical doctrine. That's one of the reasons why our society is in such a mess. And we have morality that's all twisted and distorted. And we're taking thousands upon thousands of unborn babies and, and slaughtering them. It's because the church is all mixed up and doesn't know how to stand for the truth. Second, to train for godliness, realize the eternal impact. Verse 8 says, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, physical training has its place, but it definitely has limitations. You can go to the gym as much as you want, but the, the reality is, is that if our Lord tarries, you're still going to get old and die. That's, that's just the reality of it. You're going to get old and you're going to die. You can take your kids to every sporting event under the sun, you can spend a fortune for equipment and for fees and for gasoline to cart them from one place to another, but they will only play a few years at best. Well, preacher, you don't understand my little Johnny or my little Susie. I mean, oh, oh my goodness, you just don't understand the promises there. Well, let's just talk about that for a second. And again, I, I like sports and I, I do some of that, but the odds of your child athlete making a college sports team average about 5% or less. Now, this is according to the NCAA website, so this is a pretty authoritative source. The odds of a college player going on to pro sports are about 3 to 4% of that 5%. So the odds, on the other hand, of a child having to stand before God and give an account of his life are 100%. The odds of a child, especially in this day and age, needing a strong spiritual foundation with rock-solid biblical values is 100%. So whether you're a fitness enthusiast or you're a parent of a child athlete, Paul is saying here, don't major on the minors. Don't invest the bulk of your time and your money and to your emotions into something that has no eternal value. Train for godliness. We need men and women and boys and girls who are willing to train themselves for godliness. The Apostle Paul says along the same lines in Romans 12, 1 through 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So fitness and competitive sports, they, they have their place, but they are no substitute for training in godliness. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. 
Don't shortchange yourself. Don't shortchange your kids or your grandkids or other people around you by thinking and living otherwise. The greatest need of American society today is not another stellar athlete. I mean, we've got a lot of stellar athletes, but that's not the crying need today. The need is a man or a woman of God who is born again, who is grounded in God's word and governed by God's spirit and is producing the fruit of the spirit. So being grounded in God's word and driven by God's spirit only results from spiritual training. You'll make an eternal impact not only in your life, but also in your child's life and in your grandchild's life, and in the lives of the people around you, and in the lives of their children and their children, you will create a spiritual legacy that will continue to live long after you're dead and gone. To train for godliness, realize the eternal impact. Third, to train for godliness, spend yourself for the gospel. Spend yourself for the gospel. 1 Timothy 4, 9 through 10 says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So in verse 9 here, Paul is introducing verse 10. This is a common practice. He's done in another place. Uh, he's making the point that what he's about to say is very important, so pay attention. He does something very similar in 1 Timothy 1, 15. He says there, the saying is trustworthy and a full acceptance. He says those same words, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. So in other words, Paul wants you to grasp the importance of what he's going to say in verse 10. So when an athlete is competing in an event, he puts his all into it, or she puts her all into it. And at the end of the competition, normally, he or she is just completely spent. It's the climax it's the point of, of that particular event or that particular season. It's the point of all the hours upon hours and hours of physical training. So when it comes to spiritual training, spend yourself in sharing and living the gospel. And this spend yourself means you just put your all into it, just as an athlete would, would strain and stretch in, in, in the home stretch to, to break the tape and to be first or to do his best or to her best. So when it comes to living and sharing the gospel, spend yourself at it. Put your all into that. That's what the words toil and strive mean here. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26 through 27. He says, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul again says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So the race for you, this is a race that's being described here. And Paul is, is pretty much a sports fan. You see it coming up again and again in his writings. But the race for you and me as born-again believers is sharing the gospel and living the gospel for the glory of Almighty God. That's the race. That's what you spend yourself. It's not just gaining money. It's not saving money. It's not having a bigger house. It's not having a nicer car. It's not having an outstanding career. It's living and sharing the gospel for the glory of God. Now, you can do it through your job, and you can do it through your school, and you can do it through all kinds of different means, but that's the end goal is sharing and living the gospel. And you can't run the race well. And you can't finish the race well if you don't train. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. Now, physical training, when, when you do that, uh, it usually results at the end of the season or at the end of the event uh, in some kind of tangible recognition uh, at the end of it all. Uh, it may be a trophy. It may be a medal. Uh, it may be a shirt, it may be a team jersey, 
Um, but you know where most of those things end up? In the closet. I mean, a yard sale. Somebody said a yard sale. That's true. Now, there may be one or two that's on a mantle or on a wall, but usually that's as far as they go. Few people, if anybody, is going to remember those things 100 years from now. But when you spend yourself for the gospel, the reward is eternal. Paul says every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So when the point of your life is to glorify God through living and sharing the gospel, the reward is the souls of men and women and boys and girls. Nothing exceeds that. Even a Super Bowl ring means absolutely nothing compared to one whose soul has, has their eternal destiny changed because God worked through you. You and I only have a short time on this earth. The older that you get, I'm sure just about everybody here is my age or older, you'll just verify that the older you get, the faster time seems to move. It just seems like the, you got to get a lot of emails on there. Time just keeps moving and it keeps accelerating. The older we get, the faster it goes. Well, listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. Look carefully then how you walk, in other words, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, the opportunities that you have, because the days are evil. So don't just live for any purpose that comes across your path. This lost world desperately needs salt and light. It needs men and women who have trained themselves in godliness. So train yourself for godliness. Spend yourself for the gospel. So how do I get started, preacher? What do I do? Well, if you haven't been born again, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. You start there. You can't do anything else until you're born again. If you have been born again, commit to biblical doctrine. Learn, pray, grow, serve. Join the, the, the family here at Beulah Baptist and get involved in sharing the gospel and encouraging others to do the same. So this morning, are you up for the challenge? The Lord is calling you, each one of you, through his word to train yourself for godliness. Will you respond to what he's calling you to do? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning, for the insights of your word and for the direction that it gives to us, we are so very thankful. Where would we be without the, the light of your word to, to illuminate our path and to show us the way to go and the way in which we should live? Father, we live in a, in a lost and, and dying world. We see things around us getting worse day by day. We read the headlines. We, we hear the news. We look at articles on the Internet, and we see how things continue to decline. And, Father, we know that the only hope for this lost society is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. But, Father, we also know that for us to be effective in ministry and to be used by you, that it's important for us to train ourselves for godliness. Your word has commanded us to do so. So, Father, this morning, forgive us for the times that we've been lazy. Forgive us for the times when our priorities have been all out of whack. Forgive us when we've focused upon other things and we've lost sight of the eternal things. This morning, Father, for those here who don't know Christ, may that person say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Give me a new heart and mind. I want to live for you, and I want to make an eternal impact on those around me. For those of us here who have been born again, Father, may we focus upon you. May our priorities be struck straight. May our houses be in order, and may we be training ourselves so that we will be able to give an answer to all of those who may question why we believe as we do and to take advantage of the opportunities as they present themselves to us. Father, the fields today are white unto harvest, and you've given us the challenge to train ourselves so that we can go forth and share, and we can be workers that are pleasing to you. Father, we pray that you would convict each one of us, that you would draw us in the direction that you'd have us to go. Convict us of our need to follow this passage this morning, and may we grow and mature and be the salt and light 
that this world so greatly needs today. For it's in Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning and you'd like to come forward and, and make a public decision of faith and indicate to others that you're asking Christ to save you of your sin, we'd love to have you do that. Uh, you're among friends here. Nobody's going to look down on you or judge you. We're going to rejoice with you. If you'd like to rededicate your life, come publicly as well. If you want to join this church family, we'd love to have you here at Beulah. I can't think of a better church to advise you to, to join than Beulah Baptist Church. Uh, and so if the Lord's working on you about that, come this morning and, and, and just respond to what he'd have you to do. Our hymn of invitation is number 384, Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow. We'll do the first and the last verses. Let's stand as we sing. Jason Griffith, would you close us in prayer, please?